Okay, we'll get started in just a minute. People are still filtering in. All righty. Okay, looks good. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Brittany Kerfoot. I'm the Deputy Director of Events at Politics and Prose, and I would like to welcome you all to tonight's PNP Live event. Just a couple of housekeeping items to go over before we begin. Um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat right now for where you can purchase the book Pet Nation straight from PNP. Um, and in this time of crazy uncertainty and businesses closing, um, we really rely on our customers to support us and other independent bookstores so that we stay open and stay alive to get to the end of this. So we really appreciate your purchases. And I'll drop a link for where you can buy that book um, multiple times. And you can have it shipped or you can choose in-store pickup if you're local and you don't have to wait for shipping. You can also ask the author a question tonight by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A space instead of the chat, just because it keeps it easier to, for me to filter through and have them all in one place. But it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's author, Mark Cushing, the founding partner and CEO of the Animal Policy Group and author of tonight's book, Pet Nation, The Love Affair That Changed America. As an owner of six rescue pets myself, I am so excited to hear more about the way pet ownership has changed over the years and what it says about human nature and us as people as a whole. So please help me welcome Mark to PNP and we will start talking all about pets. Hi, Mark. Brittany, good evening. Congratulations on your rescues. You can feel free to name them if you want. That's all of our <laughs> prerogative as, as pet owners. Well, two of them are named after S Law & Order SBU characters. I have Elliot Stabler and Olivia Benson. Those are pit bull mixes. <laughs> and then a bulldog named Lola. And uh, three cats named after literary characters. So there's Sylvia Plath, Ernest Hemingway, and Humbert Humbert. <laughs> And you haven't told Sylvia uh, what her namesake, how, how things ended no, up for we're gonna, her. <laughs> we're going to leave that out. <laughs> All right. That's that's great. Well, nice to be here, and I appreciate the chance to to talk to your 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 friends. Yeah, this is such a. Why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about the book, and especially like what inspired you to write it in the first place. <laughs> the uh, the book is a story. It, it, picture going up about fifteen hundred feet and looking across the American landscape. Uh, at what happened with pets in the last 20, 25 years. It's not a how-to, how to raise a Shih Tzu, you know, how to convince your cat to, to sit on your lap um, and so forth. It's very much a look at what I call a social and cultural transformation of the entire country as a result of pets in the last 25 years. So it's been one generation who was kicked off by baby boomers and then their millennial and Gen Z children just took it and ran at a pace we really can't keep up with. And no one saw it coming, and it has uh, ramifications legally, politically, socially, culturally. Uh, the Pope challenged us, so that's that's a fun topic. Um, and I was approached uh, by an agent because I'm I'm on the inside, if you will, to look at that. And it's been a topic I've spent a lot of the last ten years realizing what was happening was more than aren't pets cute? Aren't they nice to have around when you're come home from work um, to just how transformational it is. A great example that, that I, I really appreciate because it's a hard hit industry in COVID, which is the hotel business. And 25 years ago, essentially hotels said no dogs allowed, you know, no pets. Right. And if, I've got a papillon named Louie. Uh, and if I'd shown up with Louie and say, can I have a room? They'd say, uh, where are you camping tonight? Because Louie's not <laughs> staying here. And in fact, take <laughs> Louie out of the lobby. He doesn't even get to be exactly. on our premises. Today, uh, without dogs asking for it, uh, none of this they asked for, um, hotels like Kempton's, of which D.C. has many, uh, most of which I've stayed at, um, they have special floors now for non-pet owners. In other words, the hotels <laughs> for pets, bring your pets, any and all. If you don't have a pet and maybe you have an allergy or not, you can stay on floor nine, and that's reserved for that group. And Nobody would have seen that coming, and we, we, yeah. have, we have some time tonight. We can talk about a lot of examples of how that's changed. And it has some political implications. We don't have to kick off, but uh, you are located where you are. Um, we'll talk about some political spinoffs that are interesting challenges we face. Yeah. 
Well, you mentioned the Pope and I've read the book, but for those who have not read the book, tell us the story about the Pope because it's just, it's so great. Now, now my mother passed away at 94. She lived a great life, uh, had a photo of Pope Francis the first on her coffee table in her assisted living her last three years of her life. And she was never not looking at us. So she never forgave me for this viewpoint that I put in the book, but I have to share it. In 2015, he gave an interview to an Argentinian uh, journalist and he's from Buenos Aires um, where uh, you know parrots get treated better than dogs. And maybe that's mm -hmm. part of his, uh, his issues. He's still working out uh, in the Vatican. But in any event, he basically said the following, uh, pets are automated program love you're kind of wasting your time on that. And, and all the time you spend goodwill sharing with pets, it's depleting your ability to be good to humans and to be nice to humans mm -hmm. and to help people. And God forbid you would have pets only and not children. And he mm -hmm. warned about how life would end up there. And it was this very gloomy zero sum theory that if parents watched their daughter play in a park and then they turned to watch the kitty play in the park they really wouldn't be able to turn back to their daughter and 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 enjoy it, um, and it, honest to God, it is a silly idea because in yeah. fact pets bring out the best in people. They take mm -hmm. introverts that have a hard time talking and certainly meeting strangers, and two dog owners meet and and after 20 minutes they know everything about their pets. Um, so my suggestion is so you have a lot of clout at politics and pros. Maybe the Pope will, will listen to you. I'd, I'd love to debate it. <laughs> or just maybe when we pitch in and buy him a Corgi and just tell him to get down <laughs> yeah. on the floor of one of his, you know, 14th century rugs and right. just play with him for half an hour and see if his, his mood doesn't change. But it's a very odd argument he makes. And, and, and he repeated it in two or three sermons, but I haven't heard it in the last three or four years. So maybe, maybe it didn't go over so well in, in, in Rome. I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> But uh, so I, I pick on him in the in the book. It just seemed too too easy to do, and I, I couldn't I couldn't avoid it. Well, and we know right that that children with autism, for example, or children with disabilities, are often um, given a therapy dog um, or a companion animal. And even I mean, you know, adults have it now. You can get certification, take your dog on the plane, different hotels. Um, but I mean, there is science to back up that these yeah. animals are helping these children and even adults get through life easier. It, it's interesting. It, it wasn't that long ago. It was in the 80s that the, the dean of the Washington State Veterinary School, Leo Bustad, create, created the phrase human-animal bond. And for 15 years, there was you know rampant skepticism that this was like your grandmother's homemade flu remedy. What do you mean right. pets medically and scientifically do something for us? Now, uh, Human Animal Bond Research Institute, or HABRI, which is headquartered, you know, not far from, uh, from your bookstore, uh, mm -hmm. they have 29,000 entries in their library at Purdue that, are, that they're not all peer reviewed, but many are. And they're, basically it's proven now your oxytocin level goes up and your cortisol level declines. And the one makes you relaxed, happy, less stressful. The other creates stress in your life. And it also happens for the pet because there was legitimate concern early on in the science of, of pets and people. Is this just a one-way street that, that people get all the, the goodies? Well, well, you just have to look how pets live now. I think the goodies are shared pretty well, but- uh, <laughs> For mine, they your, certainly are. <laughs> yeah, they're certainly on your bed and they're on the pillow, and, yeah. um, but, but it worked both ways. And so there's two aspects. There's that aspect, just what the engagement does for, for the pet and, and the person. And then the second is that, that we have now animals, animal assisted therapy or pet partners that are in almost all hospitals in the country. And you're, right. you know, DC is not far from New York and New York is one of the last states that allowed pets in the hospitals, specifically dogs. And the view was good God, do not let dogs roam the hallways of a hospital, you know, rampant disease and, you know, we'll have to shut down. Uh, my wife teaches uh, anatomy at Mayo Clinic in, in Scottsdale here in Arizona, which is why I'm trying to hide from the sun. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> here. People wonder what's shining. I mean, is my mom trying to send me bolts from heaven to quit talking about the Pope? <laughs> exactly. but, uh, but anyway, um, Mayo has a major program and almost all hospitals do now. They even bring pets now into emergency rooms. Guess what? Yeah. For the staff, for the staff to decompress after an hour or two hour run where they haven't had a break. 
uh, you have dogs capable of detecting drops in glucose levels for diabetic patients at a, at, a, at a better, more accurate, predictable rate than technology does. So it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. You know, we're putting dogs and pets to work again in a way, which is what they used to do for thousands of years, but right. it's in a humane manner and, and, and there's strict standards involved. Uh, and, and it's a lot of the reason why this is all taken off. The stories about pets got people, you may have had four pets, not six, or two, not six. I mean, you, you just tiptoe into pet ownership and you realize right. something's happening here and it's, and it's a, uh, you know, it's hard to say no to. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> or, or impossible in your case, apparently. Right, yeah. The last two of mine were not right. planned. They were accidental adoptions, but um well, you talked about kind of the physiological response. And I know when I was in college, we had dogs during like midterms and finals. We had rescue dogs come and so that we could decompress and right. de-stress. Um, do you think that's why in this time of COVID and, and this a lot of uncertainty and a lot of people are feeling very anxious and very depressed, do you think that's why these shelters are emptying out and so many people right. in the last few months have adopted animals that maybe didn't have them before the pandemic? It, I mean, two, two things happened. One was you had people that had one dog get a second or one dog get a cat. But I mean, literally people drove home to quarantine that first week back in March, which seems like two years ago. Um, and they stopped off to get a pet. And I, I think they had reason to believe either, you know, I've been thinking about it. I'm going to be home. I might as well try it. I've got the time right. to do it, particularly with a puppy, because it takes more than just an evening. You know, hi, puppy. Yeah. You know, nice to see you. Um, yeah. I think both both things were were in place, and I think it surprised people the pace of it. I can't say I'm surprised that it happened, but the pace of it, particularly in Florida, that shelter that they had, you know, on social media everywhere, where 40 volunteers, each one stood by a different kennel that was empty now, that had been full of dogs, you know, for so much of the last uh, period of time, and now what's interesting is you have a New York Times story uh, a week and a half ago where they think a third of pet owners, if they go back to work, who got a pet, may get a second pet to keep that pet mm -hmm. company. Now, the, right. the, the little secret we'll probably talk about is if a third of pet owners went out tomorrow on Friday the 11th and said, by God, I'm going to go get another pet, a dog, particularly a dog, they couldn't find one. You, you could not meet that demand right now. And I mean, we're at an interesting stage uh, of, of the pet nation phenomenon where we don't have enough dogs and but but it's 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 a strong sign and what's not going to happen I'll tell you is that people are going to go back to work and go, drive up to the Washington Humane Society and say here take take Fluffy uh, I'm done with her she was a great companion for five months because you get uh, you get hooked on the animal right. and, the, and, and the pet and you, and you can't give it up and also pets besides dogs and cats were adopted. I always, I have a chapter in the book, which as you know, begins with a pet that was a 19 foot reticulated python. Yeah. By the way, you, you, your neighbor in, in, in urban DC uh, in that apartment number seven E might, it might have a python and you just, you can't, you can't be sure, but oh, uh, we have headshot. We have, do we have the most eclectic collection of pets in America yeah. and, and, and they're, and they have bonds with their owners. I mean, it's, it's not just cats and dogs that people, uh, engage with, but we can, we can talk about that if you want. Yeah. And I feel like at least my pets, and I don't think I'm projecting this onto them, but that they're very in tune with my emotions yeah. um, and that they know kind of how I'm feeling. So for example, last year, our elderly cat passed away and I was always, I was obviously very upset and they seemed more attuned to me. They seemed more attentive. They stayed around me much more. Um, and so I wonder if you know, everyone is feeling more anxious and, and um, things are so stressful right now that the pets really bring a sense of like calm to them. I don't think there's any question they do. And, and, and it's, it's not just anecdotal evidence. There, there's finally a, a, a legion of researchers. What comes with a topic becoming culturally popular is that academia often follows because there's interest now and, and there's funding. And, and that's definitely happening and, 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 yeah. you, and you see it. And, and basically, you know, dogs and cats, which is roughly 185 to 190 million pet dogs and cats in America, um, they are smart animals. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they figure out, 
not just where the food's hiding, but, but they have a sense, you know, if they know your patterns, you take one step in the morning and they think it's towards the door to leave and yeah. they're down and they're there, you know, like, where are we going? You know, the assumption being you're obviously taking me with you. Uh, you wouldn't conceive of right. going somewhere without me. And uh, now you've right. got six at the door, so they've got a, <laughs> yeah, I need to get a bigger car. <laughs> they're, they're fighting, I'm sure. But anyway, no, I think that's, I think that's very true. And, and that's, uh, and, the, and the other aspect of pets and it's, it's, it's true in a pandemic, notwithstanding social distancing. And I've lived in DC uh, uh, in, the, in the 2000s um, and very urban, lots of parks, you know, uh, in many cases, original parks, you know, designed by uh, Cabozier, uh, is that pets create social capital. Mm. Two people walking down the street without a pet in a city generally don't even make eye contact. Not because they're rude, they, they think it's almost rude to stare. Like, you know, if I were yeah. to look in your eyes, you'd think, hey, you're stalking me or something. Um, right. Two people with pets stop, have a conversation. So there was a study done in Perth on the western edge of Australia. And it was, it was trying to figure out and determine sources of social capital. And social capital is an academician's term for what are those ingredients that make a city work or a neighborhood work? Reduce stress, create trust, reduce fear, uh, make strangers become friends, help each other out in need and, and so forth. And everything was on the table and pets won. Pets came out as the number one factor. So um, with the help of Mars, um, and Mars is, is, is a, the biggest both pet food and veterinary company in the world. Most people or many know it for, for chocolate, but uh, Mars helped fund a study in San Diego, Portland, Oregon, which is my original home, and uh, Nashville, and replicated the study. And then they went back in Perth and did it again, I think, because there was so much skepticism. And the answer is in all cases was no, it's pets. Pets are the driving factor. So the presence of pets. So that began to cause apartment owners and cities to put pressure on apartment owners to say, wait a second, uh, no pets with, in, let's take a, you know, an isolated senior you know, in, in Bethesda, lives in the seventh floor, you know, may not move, may not leave the apartment all day. That cat she has, that's, that's the one living, forgiving, giving creature you know, right. that, that can respond to her. So um, very little evidence of that. And then I, I think you know, I, I've spent a lot of trying, time in, you know, on, the, on my day job in the industry and the profession trying to push that idea out that barriers to pet ownership are counterintuitive. They, they, you may think that, that the community appreciates it. In fact, good things would happen. And, and one of the real um, tragedies right now in public policy are the failure of the federal government. And this, this covers every administration for, for for 40 years, so it's Democrat, Republican, and so forth, to not enforce the public housing laws that make that mandate pet access. Uh, New right. Jersey, it, it's a state we love to pick on sometimes. New Jersey has a law, the most progressive law in the country that says every senior apartment, every senior multifamily building in New Jersey, whether it's publicly financed or privately, so it covers all, a wealthy condo or a publicly financed on the edge of uh, in the inner, inner city of Newark, it doesn't matter. They must be pet friendly. Mm. I had staff spend three months. I had staff spend three months three years ago trying to find a single public official or interest group, an NGO, that knew about and cared and enforced that law. And mm. in almost every case, the conversation was, "Well, we didn't know about that." And we would say, "Well, here I'm reading from it. It's you know," and I'd read the, the state code, and it'd be like, "Oh, that's interesting." So there's this myth. Uh, I had a conversation with a major city official, not in New Jersey, but I'll, I'll, I want to leave the city anonymous for now, uh, a year ago, who was head of public housing. And I said, have you, do you have any idea whether or not your, your buildings are pet friendly? And if they're not, do you have any steps planned to change that? And she looked at me like, she said, first of all, no, I don't know. Why? I mean, and the why was so instinctive. It was like, why? Why would you ask that? And I, and so I began to share, you know, the knowledge and studies and research we had. And I was sort of talking to the wall. There was a sense that, and I, I, I didn't say it, but the sense was that, well, poor people can't afford pets. Truth is, 
People that make 30,000 a year or less in the United States own dogs at the same rate, short of two points, but it's essentially the same percentage as people that make $100,000 or more. You know, you can spend a ton of money on a pet, but you don't have to. Right. And, and, and they may be even more valuable when you have less amenities and less yeah. other choices and so forth. And it's, you know, I, I think the next five years, that'll be an area, uh, you know, I'm going to be engaged in, and I hope, you know, others will be too. And there are a lot of people talking about that now that that's, that's a real oversight, maybe not just intentionally ill will, but just an oversight and needs to be addressed. Um, so. Yeah. What are, so housing and pet accessibility, what are some other causes that with the animal policy group that, that you're the CEO of, what are some other kind of causes that are at the top of your list to kind of fight for right now? Well, there, there's one that we fight for all the time and it's, it's a great topic for debate. And, and fortunately we don't have enough time, you know, I'm kidding. I'll, I'll say my <laughs> piece, but um, I, I work with a lot of the, 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 the corporate uh, entities and, and good businesses involved with pets. And if you have a lawsuit against a veterinarian, against your neighbor, against a pharmaceutical company, a food company for negligence that injured or may have killed your pet, you're not allowed in American courts uh, to recover d damages, money damages for your emotional or loss of companionship. Wow. Um, and those are what have the skyrocketing big time verdicts on the human side. Um, and it often shocks people because part of the transformation of pets is that they seem like they're family members, right? So right. If, you, if you lose your 10 year old Shih Tzu and the loss is profound, why shouldn't a jury be allowed to decide? Um, and th the reason goes back, you know, I, I was a visionary and majored in medieval and Renaissance history in college. I, I, I'm not sure why I thought that was the trend, but it was a, <laughs> But, it, you know, I'll tell you, it was a common law rule back in the, you know, in the 10 hundreds and the 11 hundreds that pets are chattel or their, or their property. And you can't, right. if somebody, somebody damages your treasured chair, you can get the cost of that chair and it might be an antique and it might be a big verdict, but you can't get your emotional loss. Right. Um, and, and, but the trouble is if you change that law and, and blue states, red states, purple states have rejected efforts to change it because, uh, it would have an instant impact on the cost of vet care. Now there are human doctors in specialties where you have a two hundred thousand dollar a year premium for your liability insurance. You know, veterinarians don't even don't even remotely close to that number. Um, right. And the answer to it too is this: if your best friend, if your boyfriend or girlfriend, if your favorite aunt and uncle, your grandmother or grandparent that raised you, if they're injured, you don't get those damages either. So our Legal system says it's for your spouse or your child, and mm. but that's it's controversial. I, I lecture to a lot of vet colleges, and so you have veterinarians in the room, and when I tell them that that's the rule, they're shocked. It just seems yeah. so. It just doesn't seem fair. Like, good God, why wouldn't you allow people to get whatever that loss is? But it's that's a tough one. The, the, the best issue for people going to work and living every day in D.C. is there's a movement now that that Habry and a lot of industry leaders and, and, and animal welfare groups are interested in, which want to place pet ownership and veterinary care on the same level as uh, stopping smoking, good nutrition, anti-obesity, ec regular exercise, wellness activities that are proven to cause people to live better, healthier, mm -hmm. longer, and reduce their burden on the uh, healthcare system. The George Mason study across the river uh, in Virginia put the number at just short of $12 billion that dog ownership and pet ownership reduces demand for health services because of the wow. improved health for owners. 10 years ago in Congress, when I tell members, they'd show me a picture on their iPhone of their pet. They were proud as could be of their dog or cat, but they yeah. kind of laughed like, what are you talking about? But the answer is no, this is science. This, it actually makes people better and it's cheaper. It, it, you could, it's maybe the cheapest medicine available to improve lives. Um, and that'll be, that'll take us some time, but <clears throat> don't be surprised over the next two, three, four years, you see some activity uh, on that front. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, if you're, if your house, if you have fire insurance, right. And your house burns up in a fire, your belongings are covered. Um, and you would think that pets are more valuable and more important than a chair. 
They think so. Certainly cats yeah. think so. Oh, cats know yeah. that that's, that's a given for them. Right? They absolutely do. <laughs> they think they're priceless. Mm -hmm. They are. So the statistic is that now about two thirds of the country owns a pet. And that was not the case a right. few decades ago. So mm -hmm. how did America become this like pet adoring country when this wasn't always in our history and how do we kind of compare to other countries in terms of right. pet ownership? We are uh, in the top three or four in the world. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you they're more developed than not. In Europe, uh, the Czech Republic, interestingly, has the highest per capita pet ownership. And they're mm -hmm. very proud of that. Um, in the Latin culture in Latin America, dogs are, are 70% on average, they're not strays, but they roam free. They, mm. they will come home like cats used to. Cats would come by and they knew that your house there'd be some water or some, some food of some sort. Um, right. so, so we're at the high end, but w one uh, fact that we're watching unfold in China is that as a company or country develops a significant middle class, they, they seem to want to have two things, a car, and a cat or a dog, mm. and 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 it's a, it's a somewhat of a symbol of status. If it was a symbol of status, I think it quickly becomes a source of great pleasure, and you're not showing off your new BMW uh, the way you show off your cat. Your cat is your favorite thing now; it's, it's your big deal. Right. You know how it happened. Um, chapter two of Pet Nation. I should probably make sure people remember the name of the book. Um, chapter, <laughs> yes, I'll drop two, the link again too. <laughs> Part of the theory is Toto and Lassie and Ren Ten Ten and mm -hmm. Scooby Doo. They're, we began to see in the media, you know, real dogs, real cats, cartoons that presented heroic, fun, loyal, uh, you know, Lassie jumping through the window into Timmy's bedroom. Um, so there was a dog on a bed way before it became popular. Um, mm -hmm. Or they were just plain fun or funny, Snoopy and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then you began to see advertising agencies and the car companies were the cleverest. And they did something that I'm sure at the time we all wondered what they were doing, where they would, Subaru and Nissan, and recently Hyundai did in their holiday commercial last year. And I'll use that one as the best example. Hyundai put five Hyundais, lined them up from tallest to smallest Hyundai. And in front of the Hyundai, they put five dogs, tallest to smallest. And their executives knew one thing, that you were going to look at the dog, not the car. Mm -hmm. And they didn't care. In fact, they wanted <laughs> you to. They, their goal wasn't to have you look over the shoulder of a, of a, of a retriever. No, they didn't even tell you about the cars. You didn't know anything about the cars. They wanted you to know one thing. We're associated with dogs. Right. Dogs are part of our culture. Uh, and, and then they assumed you'd come and visit and, and ultimately go home with one. And so that happened about 20 years ago. And I, I think the convergence of those two things and then the third um, the smartphone and we all became our own film editors and producers. And mm -hmm. I remember when it was a, every day, it was a child, you know, my third, three-year-old, my first grader, my eighth grader. And then all of a sudden it just, no, no, no. Uh, don't you have kids? You have, but let me show you what, let me show you what <laughs> I did last night. You won't believe it. I watched my cat chase her tail and, and you could send these and we could watch the same breed or same type of cat in San Diego and in, you know, Hartford, Connecticut, and you go, well, that's exactly, you know, and it, it became kind of this common glue, if you will. And then barriers began to be pushed. Pet owners aren't shy about wanting to have their pet with them. And you mm -hmm. began to have a volume and people got smart and thought, why say no? You know, come on, bring your pet, the hotel example I gave earlier. And this was happening to millennials, or they were watching it happen to Gen Xers. But Millennials, who most of whom, had, um, and it wasn't you had to kind of beg your parent for, which was the case in, in my family, um, and yeah. usually unsuccessfully. Uh, I'm not asking people to to cry for me. It just was the case. My parents, <laughs> my mom, one dogs in the house. But um, you began to see uh, millennials, you know, come out of school, and just that was part of what they were going to do. They were going to have a pet. 
and and suddenly it became common. And you know, Manhattan to me is is a greatest example where you can pick any street. So we'll just pick Park Avenue, and you can walk Park Avenue in the '40s and '50s and '60s, and uh, not the decade, but the the streets, and you'll see dog walkers with you know five Afghans, mm -hmm. and and you have to kind of move out into the street. You know, you have to kind of slide around them and. And they're making good money. I mean, you know, there have been yeah. reports that a, a Manhattan dog walker on the Upper East Side can make two hundred thousand a year, um, because you, because you have the whole building, right? You know, right. And, and the owners are doing pretty well, and and those dogs aren't sitting in crates all day, um, right? The, right. You know, so it's it, it, that all these examples began to converge, and the barriers began to break down, and then the media was the best friend of the industry. It was often Tuesdays would be kind of the day that all papers covered pets and there'd just mm. be some section in the lifestyle. And, and uh, you know, now we don't read, you know, hard copy papers, it seems, but, uh, and people began to see it. And so they'd share it on social media. They'd see it in papers. They'd see the science and hear about some amazing, you know, recovery of somebody. And, and it went from, you know, they're a lot more than just fun to have around. Uh, or accessories. Uh, I grew up in a culture where they were sort of accessories. Cats or dogs might show up, they might leave, but they weren't they weren't supposed to go anywhere special. Right. You know, they they go on their own and they it, maybe they came back, maybe they wouldn't. So Yeah. Well, and now the this rise of like pet Instagram. Um I know I mm. follow a lot of famous cats and dogs and when they pass away as they inevitably do, I feel very connected and very oh, um sure. yeah. Yeah, I see. I feel for the owner when this pet, because all of us have watched this journey for years and followed this pet, and these also these people are making a, a lot. You can make a lot of money with an Instagram famous pet. Jif, Jif Palm's doing just fine. Jif Palm's yeah. doing very well, and yeah. I think the wealthiest uh, pet in the world, and I believe she's still alive, is Carl Lagerfeld's uh, cat. Oh. And who at, at, at the time of his death, the German designer, at uh, the, the time of his death, had two essentially PAs, two assistants that were just devoted to the cat's needs. I'm drawing a blank on her name, my bad, but it's in the book. So, uh, but yeah. anyway, yeah, no, that's that's an interesting, and, and mm -hmm. you know, we love to read about movie stars and their pets. Yeah. You know, uh, and I'm not talking about Mike, Tyson and his tigers in his Vegas place. That's a little, right. it's a separate uh, issue. I'm not, right. not promoting that, but uh, yeah. no, it's, and, and we're really just getting started just to terrify people that don't love pets. You know, we're just getting started here. It's not like millennials and Gen Z's are gonna dial this back. Um, no. And at that, you know, the last chapter of my book is really looking at where could this go? And, 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 and if you believe the science of human animal bond, the answer is take it as far as you can, you know? Yeah. They're good for folk. They're good for people. So why not, you know, why not encourage it? But those are battles to come, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, something that I'm really interested in is kind of the the stigmas and the myths attached to either getting your dog from a or or any animal from a breeder or a pet store mm -hmm. versus getting it from a shelter or a rescue organization. And sometimes it seems like those two groups can be very at odds. With Sometimes, each other. let me amend that and say all the time they are yeah. very odds. That's a great topic and, 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 and really appreciate you, you bringing that up. Uh, chapter six uh, I is on the political and legal fights in, 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 within Pet Nation, as I call it. And that's a central one. It, and, it's, and there's sort of the uh, adopt, don't shop. And it's, right. a, it's a, like a moral duty. You, you've got a moral obligation to go to a shelter first. Well, couple of things about that. Um, shelters are actually, uh, northern shelters in particular, their dogs aren't strays from the local community for the most part. Shelters are, um, I call them canine freedom trains. The dogs come up from the south, they come up from the lower Midwest, they come up from the southwest like LA sends them up to Portland and Seattle. And it's a good thing they do that because the dogs would be euthanized otherwise. But there's a right. shortage. You go to a shelter in, uh, you go to Washington's uh, Humane, where my daughter used to volunteer, uh, and got one of a great dog there. Um, and if you're not there by noon on Saturday, maybe noon on Friday, good luck finding a dog that's adoptable. There may be a dog there, but it's got behavioral or medical issues. So mm -hmm. there's a practical reality that's changed. 
Millennials also are very attracted to what are called kind of designer mixed breed dogs, Labradoodle. They're dogs, mm -hmm. think, the, the characteristics are they have a behavior that seems to be calm and, and you know, friendly and, and, and not aggressive, A, and they don't shed. If you right. wonder why there's an oodle at the end of a lot of those names, those breeds, it's because the poodle part is the non-shedding. Um, and they don't, they don't buy the argument that they have some moral duty to go to a shelter. And, and you know, I, I challenge the moral duty side. Here's the problem. Breeders breed in the dark for the most part, commercial breeders. Um, and transparency would in many ways would solve the problem. If people could see how the breeding works the same way we did with zoos. When I grew up, right. zoos were really like jails, concrete rooms with metal bars. The bear was in cell number one, the lion was in cell number two, tiger in cell number three, very depressing. Um, and I'm sure animal welfare and animal rights groups would have shut zoos down easily by 10 years ago if that hadn't changed. Besides changing the environment, making it look more quote, natural, they brought media in. You, you can't have a baby in a zoo and it's not on film. You, they bring kids in and, and, and right. busloads. And they basically said, come and watch how we handle the animals and then tell us if you have a problem. I'm not saying there's no zoo somewhere that doesn't mistreat an animal, but in general, that was a smart approach. That would go a long way to make commercial breeding acceptable. And, I, and I, I've been pushing that. The flip side is that there was so much mistrust between animal rights groups and breeders. They, you know, so there's a lot of thinking that every single large scale breeder is inhumane. And there are large scale breeders that are and there are large scale breeders that aren't. There are hobby breeders in rural Maryland that the parents are gone all day and there's no care whatsoever. So it's a misnomer that a pet raised in a, in a, in a small environment or a limited environment is always taken well care of. Again, I'm not saying it's always one way or the other, um, but that's a big issue. And you'll, you'll meet people that uh, if you say that you have a breed dog, there'll be a little bit of a, hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that's interesting. And that's not a, not a pleasant hmm. It's like, you know, right. And they'll ask you, did you try it? And, and again, there are shelters in the country. I want to make it very clear to, to your, to your uh, uh, audience. There are shelters, particularly in the deep South, that have too many dogs and have risks yes. of high level of euthanasia. But euthanasias are down by 95% over the last 20 years. It's a crazy wow. number. We have been so successful and this north-south interchange has been a really effective tool. Um, Minneapolis, their shelter gets dogs in Mississippi. Uh, East Tennessee, they go up to Buffalo. A Alabama sends dogs to New Jersey. You get relationships formed uh, between right. regions and it's been a, a relief valve now, would it be better if conditions and money was available to improve the shelters in the Deep South? Sure. But guess what? It's 2020 and they're still facing some of those challenges. But in the North, you take North Shore and Long Island, they have volunteers calling shelters trying to get dogs because they have demand. People want a dog. And, yeah. and they show up you know, at eight, five o'clock on a Friday evening. They're told, no, no, there's no, none left. Sorry. You know, and, and it's, you know, that's a challenge. So it, it, there's a shortage of dogs. There's a shortage of veterinarians. There's a shortage of vet techs or vet nurses in this industry right now. And those three shortages um, reflect the good side uh, that there's demand. There's, there's something right. good happening. But, but the truth is, you know, access to care, um, cost of care, access to, to a pet can be challenging. You know, it is challenging right now. Well, and I know at least just in DC, my husband and I pre COVID would go to volunteer to work for a Saturday and they would be like, um, we have availability in three months because they had so many volunteers signed up that there was a wait list to volunteer. <laughs> right. it, 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 amazing. Who, I mean, talk about something 20 years ago that people would have said, give me a break. They'd beg you to right. volunteer. And you get screamed, are you worthy of adopting from us? Yes. I've had more people tell me that, the, that they've had, to, to get a pet, it's a tougher interview than to get a job. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, you've, you've, got, there's a, you've got a score higher. So, and that's, I'm not criticizing that because you're trying to make sure you're serious about yeah. it. Yeah, um, right. But it's, a, uh, it's, it's sort of an, it's an accidental 
transformation. You know, dogs and cats didn't get together, form a union 25 years ago and say, we want to sleep on your beds and we're not going to quit <laughs> yelling until we get in. Right. You know, cats in particular, uh, they're the greatest comeback story in American history. They, all <laughs> came, they came to America on ships with one job, catch, kill, and eat all the mice and all mm -hmm. the rats. So we don't, our food doesn't get contaminated. Okay. Right. They stayed in DC and Philadelphia and Boston, New York, Chicago, Detroit, before we had public sanitation and they continued as sanitary workers, did a good job. Then they were given pink slips. All the cats got fired and they were mass euthanized, millions of them. So they had become the new rodent. They were roaming around on the streets and people said, "Get, you know, we don't want them around here. Today, right. there are slightly more pet cats than dogs. You know, how did that happen? I mean, literally, that transformation from euthanized pest to, you know, right. sleeping on your bed, you know, on a $150 fleece blanket mm -hmm. that you'd like to sleep on. Um, you know, it, that's an interesting change. You know, things like kitty litters had a little bit to do with that. Um, I don't want to say that it was just all good goodwill, but uh, it's, it's an interesting right. story. Yeah. Yeah. I know because my dogs are pit bull mixes, I know that uh, pit bulls are one of the, the most euthanized mm. dogs. Um, and speaking from personal experience, um, I mean, my pits are afraid of their own shadow. They would never, you know, they're, they're the least aggressive dogs I've ever met. Um, but I know there is a stigma about certain animals. I know black cats and black dogs often don't get adopted and they're often euthanized. Um, and so I think a lot of people think that pets that are euthanized are unadoptable or are aggressive or have behavioral problems, but that's not always true. Sometimes it's the one who was in the shelter the longest or, you know, um, taking up, up too much space. The cover of my book's a white chihuahua, right? Yeah. Now, a lot of shelters will tell you that, that at the end of the weekend, the only dogs they have left are pit bulls and some chihuahuas. Um, and the chihuahuas are the third or fourth most popular uh, breed in the country. Uh, and it's interesting. And, and when Denver passed the pit bull ban 20 plus years ago, everybody thought, okay, this is just going to sail across the country. This, this you know, is city after city. And a few others did that. But interestingly, pit bull owners, animal welfare professionals, and veterinarians uh, and ethologists showed up and said, this is not a dog wired to kill and to harm. Right. And, and, and that is unfair, you know, in the extreme, most extreme sense to the dogs, because yeah. what happened was they, they were euthanized and, right. and uh, or they created the sort of black market uh, that, so it's, it's interesting. There, there are a lot of myths about particular breeds. Um, now I'm sure people watching probably know of an incident in their, their city or town where they, uh, pit bull attacked and you know killed somebody off and a child so i'm not excusing it but but there are a lot of factors at play here not some inherent right. and so that that wave didn't happen it stopped and i and i remember i was surprised i thought that seemed like it was teed up to become a yeah national yeah i mean i know for us when we were renting get finding an apartment that allowed pit bulls was really tough often there was a weight restriction or you know, Rottweilers, German Shepherds, Pit Bulls, stuff like that just weren't allowed at all, um, even if they were a mix. And so that was really hard for us trying to find a place to live because the dog's not going anywhere. So we're going to have to find the right place because we're not getting rid of the dog. Well, you, I don't know that there's a more passionate group of pet owners than people that own Pit Bulls. I mean, and, and, and they, they, they say just what you said, that the dogs are lovely they, you know they, they, they're fun they, they're good to be with and that's changed there's still insurance companies that do that just as there's you know, the limitation on pets coming into the workplace in many cities is a function of of a liability or property insurance company requirement it's part of your business lease um, because increasingly now you're seeing companies discover that Things go better when pets are on the premises. And they some have screening for breeds, but most don't. I mean, most don't tell their workers if you have a Shih Tzu, sorry, uh, Papillon, sorry, but if you have a nice, you know, 32 pound Labradoodle, you can come stay all day and right. we'll give you a private office kind of a thing. So right. that's changing. That's changing radically. 
uh, there's been so much research done. Uh, Carrie O'Hara, uh, a PhD researcher uh, that was at Nationwide Pet at the time, did this study that proved that people that don't own pets like their company and their bosses better and will stay longer at the company if it's pet friendly. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> and I, I heard her present that and I thought, you know, she got the slide wrong. It, it, it's got to be backwards. And the answer was no, they, there's this general sense of goodwill. It could, say, it could mean a lot of things. But uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal had a story two weeks ago called Pets as Perks. The number of, of companies now providing in their employee benefits, you know, buffet, mm -hmm. their, their menu they give their employees, particularly trying to woo millennials to join them, right. pet related benefits. Wow. Across the board, pet insurance, pet telemedicine, uh, subsidy for adoption or subsidy for pet purchase. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's become awesome. common, very popular, uh, very popular employee benefit. Who would have thought that, right? Right. I love that, though. <laughs> um, I want to take some audience questions, but while I go through them, I would love to hear the audience, if they could drop in the chat, what kind of pet you have and maybe what their name is, um, just, just so we can see what all of you guys have. Um, I already went through mine, and you said you've got a, it's a Papillon, right? I have two cats uh, from the same litter from a barn in East Tennessee and a nine month Papillon puppy named Louie who has one goal in life and one, one passion, which is to chase desert lizards. <laughs> we, we, live, we live in, uh, you know, in uh, Arizona and that's all he does. He just, he just wants to go outside this fancy pants, you know, French dandy right. Papillon and he's just on the ground chasing lizards. He's caught one, uh, but he's got one in his mind for tomorrow, I'm sure, but anyway. Right, yeah, he's dreaming about them. Um, this is great, people, three dogs. Yes, me too, Jason. Three cats, Cavapoo, Lab. Um, this, that's awesome. Ziggy and Pip, those are really cute names. Um, okay, let's, I'll go to some audience questions. You guys keep, keep on telling us what your pets are. Um, so somebody, let's see, I had a good one. Let's see, Ed from Iowa City says, do you think the change in culture where we are less connected to our neighbors and such also caused replacement of some of those relationships with pets? I might have thought that, but I, it turned out the acquisition or adoption of a pet allowed you to get to know your neighbor if you didn't know your neighbor, because that, that's the social capital glue. So. I, I could see in, in certain circumstances that would be true, um, but I think it's actually had the opposite effect. Yeah, I, d I definitely find myself, uh, if, if there's a dog, you know, somebody sitting with their dog in the yard and we're on a walk or, you know, at the dog park, we always make connections, sometimes get each other's numbers, have a play date. It, it does tend to make us more social, I think. Yeah, for sure. So Gretchen says, my condo seems to be trying to limit or maybe even go pet free. They're trying to implement yearly pet fees and limit the number of pets. Do you have any suggestions or advice on how to prevent this from happening? She says she has two dogs. That's, I, I wonder if, if that uh, person lives in South Florida because there's probably no more activity uh, of that sort than, than in uh, homeowners groups and condo groups in South Florida. Um, basically, Fight it and fight it, pull the data together. There's a great survey that's um, referenced in my book. This is not a shameless way to say buy my book, but you will see in chapter nine, um, I'll talk about the survey it was done that, that actually proves how pets improve apartments. People rent longer, they will pay more, mm. they will rent faster. And increasingly property owners that, that uh, are with it, so to speak, and, and, you know, talk to somebody beside themselves will learn right. that the pets are a good thing. Um, and I think you can find neighbors that'll uh, join you, but it's, uh, and, and the thing you have to do is, is just make sure they have signs about taking care of your pet. And a lot of places have videos and they'll see the pet that nobody cleans up after. And I mean, there's ways to take the right. problem that annoys people and gets repeated and, 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 uh, stamp it out, but uh, but uh, chapter nine and, and that survey is a great survey, and I, and it's it's changed. Austin and Columbus, Ohio, Austin, Texas, Columbus, Ohio, we're at the twenty five percent pet friendly apartment level 
five years ago when my animal policy group and uh, a daughter, uh, Jillian, uh, did the research on that and, and called, pretend like she was a renter in those two cities for about two months to track it down. And it's changed radically since then. And it's not just because people love pets. Apartment owners found out that millennials aren't going to apartments that aren't pet friendly. Mm -hmm. And, and they, right. don't want, they don't want pound limitations. They don't want size limitations. You can, you can see where they might say you can't have five. Um, yeah. They at least want to be able to have two. And it's, you know, that's, that's changing. So uh, hang in there, but uh, uh, read, read chapter nine and it'll give you some uh, sources to go to. Somebody in the chat also said to call their city's housing committee. Yeah. Could maybe help. Also go to shelters. Shelters have become community resources beyond just adoption yeah. agencies and they'll help you. And then you have local chapters of humane societies. Um, tell your veterinarian that it bothers you. There's yeah. increased awareness that, that this is an issue and people are reading more about it in the industry. So I think you, you can, you won't be by yourself. Uh, oh yeah, definitely not. Um, a bunch of people want to know, since you brought up the, the dogs in the shelters in the South and how there are so many more, um, they want to know why that is. Why is there an oversupply of dogs in the South and why do they typically right. euthanize more than the North? Um, part of it has to do with income, number one. A part of it has to do with the culture that had feral dogs as just part of the culture and it was accepted and, it, and it's hard to dislodge that. Um, across the southern border of Texas, across New Mexico, Arizona, and California, um, there are much higher level of strays because the Mexican culture, and, and this, isn't, this is not an ethnic or an anti-Mexican comment, I'm just saying the culture in Mexico proper is more strays. Mexican Americans that live in Tucson, that live in Denver, you know, have immigrated to the U.S., own pets and, and handle pets the same way as, as any ethnic group does in the U.S. and and they're very, and they're very similar, but they're you know that part the Southwest generates a lot of dogs for shelters, and a lot of cases it's mis these aren't dogs that are actual strays in many cases mm -hmm. they just roam but they know that that your house is where they go to most often right. and, and, and yeah that, that can't be a problem I've heard animal control officials tell me that they'll round up dogs and realize. And the next day, 150 owners show up and go, wait a second, you, you have wow. my dog. And they're like, what do you mean you have your dog? We didn't go to your house. Well, no, my, right. dog, my dog hangs out. Um, but, uh, but the rural South has had, has had a tradition of that, and, and it's been tolerated, and there hasn't been the public support to fund shelters at the scale. And, and sorry, but that's just been, been the case, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem that hasn't been solved yet. Yeah, I know DC, uh, a friend and I drove to Georgia to pick up two dogs off the, mm -hmm. off the euthanasia list um, who were so severely abused, had, hit, had either been hit by a car and just left on the side of the road. One had a chain embedded in her neck because someone had left her out there and they're on the euthanasia list. Um, and we drove all the way down there. It was like, I don't know, 16, 17 hours. Um, but a lot of shelters in DC will work with um, euthanasia shelters in the south and bring them up here i know georgia and dc is a big one so so we've had a, a, an extraordinarily successful spay and neuter campaign the last 20 years but it hasn't been as uh, it, it costs money not not a lot of money but it does cost money Medi you know you have to have veterinarians you have to have staff you have to have uh, right. surgery equipment um and so forth and some of that hasn't penetrated pockets of the deep south. Mississippi State University has a great program. Uh, Kimberly Woodruff, I give a big shout out to, and she has a program with three mobile vans, one of which is funded by PetSmart Charities, and they, they do mobile spay neuters in northern Mississippi. And these are feral dogs for the most part. Guess what? They're now in a, uh, in a condition to be adopted and they're sent to the north. And, and it's, it, it may seem kind of like, is, is, that, is that right that we ship dogs? The truth is, ask the dog, here's your choice. Right. Here's the, in, in October, or you can be, you know, in uh, Brittany's house, uh, condo in uh, DC, yeah. how's that look? You know, and, and you've got a world champion baseball team there. So, you know, what, what are you complaining <laughs> about? But, 
you know, it's, yeah. so, so that's part of the dynamic and, and, but there, there are areas they just don't have the resources to do the uh, sheltering. Lincoln Memorial University Vet School brings dogs in from uh, Appalachian shelters who have no access to vet care, zero, none at all. They take care of them for a week. They go back to the shelter. The shelter actually gets money shipping them north. So it help, it can begin to fund staff because they're providing very healthy dogs now in good shape to northern shelters that are themselves going to be able to adopt them out. And there's 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 an economy there that that's very efficient. It's homemade, uh, but it's to be uh, applauded. Yeah. Um, someone would like to know. So you talked about how to, how vets are understaffed. There aren't enough vets, enough vet techs. So Keith wants to know, what is the future for professionalization of veterinary support staff with the recent boost in pet adoption and ownership? It, it is, it's a great time to be looking at a profession in veterinary care. Starting salaries are up, practice uh, economics are up. You, from 2019 to 2020, most veterinary practices are doing better, not worse. COVID has increased revenues. And so practices are, are having to pay more. Um, there's a lot of effort made that I'm involved in to improve the status of vet techs and vet nurses. They're not paid enough. That's just a fact. And, and they don't stay long because of that, even though they have degrees and they've been nationally board certified. And there's efforts to change that. And, and that trend's not going to be stopped. And one of the reasons why is basic economics. There are 50 to 60 private equity groups that have invested in veterinary practices and acquiring practices around the country. And don't get worried and say, oh my God, that's corporate medicine. What it is, is giving people a chance to retire that want to sell their practice. And they put money in and, and, and they know that they've got to compete and they've got to have staff to do it. And that's changing. It's not changing overnight, but it's, it's, it's a, good, uh, a good trend. And, and, and that profession is more popular. The, the problem is going to be just finding enough people, honestly. Right. Because you never make quite as much as a human doctor or a dentist makes. Sure. And it's still basically the same college curriculum. It's yeah. tough. You've got to, got to be able to do that. Yeah, I've always thought that was crazy. Um, this is a great question, especially because I went through this myself recently. Um, this person says, we hear so much about pets now being considered family members and the positive effect they have on our mental health. However, we hear little or not enough about what happens to our mental health when our pets become ill and when we eventually have to let them go. Sometimes other pet guardians don't understand our inconsolable grief. Could you please address changes in attitudes that you've seen over the years toward understanding and recognizing pet loss grief? Yes, and probably the best example of how that's being addressed much more thoughtfully and humanely um, are two amazing women veterinarians, one in Berkeley, California, Shay Cox, and one Danny McVetty in Tampa, and each have hospice practices. Um, in, in Danny's case, it's national. In Shay's case, it's throughout the West. And, and these are veterinarians and, and vet techs or vet nurses. And all they do is work with families when you've reached that stage that you know your dog or your cat, maybe you know a month, maybe six months out. And it's a very methodical, thoughtful, hands-on, um, and it doesn't stop the weeping and, and the sorrow and the loneliness when, when the death finally occurs, yeah. but it's, it's a way to get ready for it. And, and, and it's, it's rather than going and saying, here's Fluffy, uh, I, can't, I, I just can't wait, I can't see it. I know it's gonna happen, let me just hug her one more time and she goes in the back of the vet clinic, which burns out vet staff big time. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing about being a veterinarian in many respects is that you care for a pet for 10, 12, 15 years and then you're expected to, to kill a pet for humane reasons. Um, and don't think that that's something that doesn't wear on people. So there's, that's a big topic. And it's connected to wellness of uh, veterinarians and, and a higher suicide rate for veterinarians and other professionals. Yeah. So that's a great question, but, it, but it, there's a lot of activity there now. And, and I, there's a recognition that, that for every player in the, in the process, veterinarian, pet owner, family and all that. So it's, it's improving. For yeah, sure. I know if you live in the DC or Nova area, um, the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria does a great pet, pet loss support group. Um, they're not meeting virtually just because of Zoom privacy laws, but um, for, for people who are interested, I'm sure you could just Google 
pet loss support group um, in your area, and I've I've been to a couple, and it was very helpful. Um, and I know those are becoming more prominent because um, I think there was a long time for a stigma of people who are grieving their pets so greatly um, that they felt maybe embarrassed by it or people didn't understand or people thought it was silly. Um, but I think now it's become a lot more, I hope, understood that this is a member of the family and this grief is something that is very real. There's even a group, uh, a nonprofit called Pets Peace of Mind. It's national, uh, very active in the DC area. They train human hospice facilities and staff so that a person in the last stage of their life can have their pet with them. Oh, wow. And they arrange for the adoption out of the pet so that the pet owner doesn't go, what's gonna happen? And that's crucial right now because baby boomers have owned the most pets in American history. Now, millennials have caught them, but but the point yeah. is ownership declined some. It's not because they moved from a bigger house in Alexandria to an apartment in downtown DC. It's that they're not sure what's gonna happen and, and how they can handle right. it. The resources to take care of pets, the, the ease of getting uh, services and things online, all of that's now there's an uptick finally, and I think you're gonna see baby boomers who've enjoyed pets all their life, not hit age 75 and go, well, that part of my right. life's over when they don't want it to be. Um, and that's right. one small part. So yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Um, I will end with, because I want people to buy this book um, if you wanna learn more about pets and pet ownership and how it has evolved. Um, but what do you hope, why do you want people to read this book? Why do you think it's important? What do you want people to take away from reading this book? Okay, I'll, I'll try to stop at three or four things quickly. Number one, <laughs> what the book is about pet owners more than it's about pets. You're going to learn that you're part of a massive, cool, extremely creative movement that's changed this country. And, and so why not see what you've been part of? Number two, it's going to explain to you how it all happened. And you're going to connect some dots in your own life and your own personal history. That'll be interesting. I think number three, it'll cause you to go, I might get another dog, another cat. In other words, <laughs> don't be afraid to do it. And, and I do hope finally it, it, uh, it, it turns people into sort of foot soldiers for removing barriers to pet access. The example of the, of the apartment that the, the, the one woman raised. And I'd like to see people get more engaged, not just to make my job easier, but uh, to have other people at the table, but just to really push out because I do think if, if people are healthier and, and, and they live better and they're happier and there's less stress with pets, why don't we want more of them? So I make the radical mm -hmm. suggestion. Uh, you can, you can uh, look at me and go, that guy's crazy. I think we could double the number of pets in America and, and we have room for it. You can't require people to have a pet. No, that's not gonna be the way it works. Like remove the barriers and because people do better with pets. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I think that's a good thing. So, and it, there's some good stories in there. I think you'll enjoy, uh, you'll, you'll enjoy it along the way. So thanks for having me on the, on, on the program. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everyone go out and buy the book from politics and prose. Give your pet an extra hug and kiss tonight if you have one. I know I will be doing that. My, one of my cats was around here somewhere, but he wandered off. Um, but thank you guys so much for, for coming out tonight for this and, um, everybody stay safe and stay well read. All right. Good night.